Welcome back. It's Oscars weekend, and here's how we do Oscars in Nerdland. We pull together a panel with a historian, a comedian, and an activist, and then we dissect the very guts of pop culture. Now, since its release last August, the film The Help, based on the book of the same name, has grossed $206 million at the box office, and it's up for a best picture at the Oscars. And tomorrow night, if the Academy keeps the award season love going, 2011's feel-good movie will have even more reason to celebrate. The real stories of black women domestic workers are among the most compelling narratives in our country's history. The Oral History Project of Spelman College has collected dozens of these stories. Like that of 87-year-old Edith Johnson, who remembers, quote, I worked for a woman who would not let me sit at the table. She gave me a sandwich, and I sat at the top step going to the basement. There are women who, after the assassination of Medgar Evers, organized to resist the state-sanctioned terrorism of white supremacist groups like the Ku Klux Klan. And there is the woman who, long before she became a civil rights icon for refusing to give up her seat on a bus, once made a living as a domestic worker. And so many more. Black women's resistance in the Jim Crow South certainly amounted to a lot more than a couple slices of scatological pie. But in the help, art does not imitate life. This story of a white woman who tells the story of black maids erases and then rewrites a rich and robust history in which black women never needed anyone to speak for them. The true story is that for some white people and the black female domestics who work for them, there really is a much closer to a horror film than a light-hearted drama. Just ask those who found themselves at the mercy of Jim Crow justice at the end of the lynch mob's rope or a burning torch. In the real story, white men are not the benign, henpecked husbands of the help film. They are not a, a group of mean girls in Donna Reed dresses who are the most terrifying villains. For black maids, the threat of rape was always a clear and present danger. And even as I'm appalled at the gross historical inaccuracies of the help, the truth is I'm deeply moved by the actresses in the film, who in many ways got it just right. But more than 70 years after Hattie McDaniel used her talent to bring depth and dignity to her role as a maid, it is an indication of Hollywood's continuing limitations that Viola Davis and Octavia Spencer would have to use their extraordinary talents to do the same thing. Back with me at the table are Elon James White, creator and host of This Week in Blackness. Joining him now are Mickey McKellar, author of Clinging to Mammy. She's also an assistant professor of history at the University of Connecticut. And Barbara Young, national organizer of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Barbara has been a domestic worker for the past 17 years and is an active member of Domestic Workers United. Thank you all for being here. I actually want to start with you, Mickey, for, for two reasons. One, you know, I went absolutely nuts when this film came out, and I had a lot of critical things to say. And there were lots of folks who said, oh, you're just mad because a white woman wrote it. Um, and I said, no, my favorite book written about black domestic workers is actually written by a white woman, and it's your text, Clinging to Mammy. I was just hoping maybe you could help us to put into historic context why, why in 2011, 2012, are we still so enthralled with this idea of, of a, a made figure? Right. I think primarily what this film does, is it, and what the book does, is it presents us with a Mammy narrative for the 21st century. It refits the Mammy iconography, the Mammy story, that a woman, a black woman working in a white household loves the people she works for. She's not there for wages. She's not there because she's coerced to be there. Mm -hmm. This goes back to the history of enslavement, that she's not forced to be there, but she wants to be there. She authorizes those relationships because she loves the people there. Um, and in this way, this film produces a story and the book produces a story that sets this in the context of civil rights and segregation, but says at the end of the day, these women still love the white people they work they for. for. Now, no, Miss Young, I know that, that you've actually said you felt like that that moment, for example, of the relationship between the the young child uh, and her nanny is one of the most humanizing aspects of the film. You have a, a very different critique than what both Mickey and I have had. Yes, um, as a domestic worker myself here in New York, Melissa, uh, when I saw that aspect of the film. I was really moved. I was touched by the hum human feeling that um, Abilene bring to the, the movie and to the child when she got down on her knees. Mm -hmm. She was about to be fired from her job 
and she got down on her knees. And it brings me back to, to so much that I myself went through as a domestic right. and worker and other nannies go through from day to day as, a na as working as domestics. You know, um, for instance, I was a nanny working for a family seven years, uh, <clears throat> loved the children I work with. Right. Um, and then the family would go out at night. Sometimes my work week would be six days, working 16 hours. Right. And, and they would go out at night when time for me to, to finish my shift and go home. Right. And come back at 1 and 1.30 in the morning. Right. And I would be on the street at 2.30 trying to get home. Right. B without fair for a cab fare. Right, right. And, and, and this is the challenge, is, is on the one hand, wanting to acknowledge that there is a possibility of human compassion, love, even across status differences and race differences, but, but also acknowledge that fair labor practices matter. I mean, the work that you do is, is not, oh, don't worry, because, because we love the children, we don't need cab fare or reasonable working hours, right? It's, we may, in fact, have affection for the children whom we're caring for, but, but we also need fair practices. Elon, I know you also went nuts on Twitter while watching. I just saw it yesterday. <laughs> I specifically watched it for this. And all of the uh, points are, are, are valid. Uh, my issue with the movie, uh, like I said, separating Viola Wallace, uh, uh, I mean uh, Viola Davis, yeah. out of the movie because I'm, her performance, fine, as an artist, great. The Disneyfication of this really deep deep thing was problematic because it was supposed to be about the black heroines but to me it was more like a, a, a white woman's coming of age yes. where she learned all these things and all of a sudden they just sprinkled a little oppression just on top of it just so that people felt deep about it it's like no this could have been just with Jennifer Aniston uh, and uh, they could have just like grown well yeah and, and the fact is I actually might have even liked the movie had some had it been pitched as a entirely fictional because look in fiction you can do anything I was watching the Transformers the other night right in my car my camera is not actually going to stand up and walk around. So in fiction, you can do anything. But it was presented as though it were historically accurate. And it was presented as though it was from the viewpoint of women who were working as domestic workers. When instead, it really was from Miss Skeeter's right. viewpoint, right? It right. really was about her sort of coming of about, age. About Miss Skeeter, um, she was the one who um, wrote the, the stories of the, the maids and that. I am the real-life domestic worker. Right. <laughs> and... Uh, and and I see uh, I can see what she did in the movie because she tell her story at the end and the love she had for the woman that take care of her, mm -hmm. and um, today her story um, to me was giving those women a voice, and today domestic workers are finding their voice. At the at the the beginning of the program, you started with. Um, Rosa Parks. Yeah. Rosa Parks was not just one individual that sat down on a bus. She was part of a movement. Mm -hmm. Indeed. That um, wanted to speak out for the wrongs that were happening to them at yeah. that time. Miss Young, I'm so glad you bring up Rosa Parks. We actually have a little piece of, a, of the letter that, that Rosa mm -hmm. Parks wrote about her sexual violation during the time that she was serving as a, as a domestic worker. Do we have, we have that image? We don't. Okay. I thought at some point we did. So, uh, but but part of part of Rosa Parks' story is a story of being violated by the white man in the household for whom she worked. And I think part of what was so distressing to me about the movie was that that aspect was so left out. Exactly. All of the frameworks of exploitation, all of the frameworks of segregation are actually held external to the experiences of the women in this film. So the civil rights movement happens almost as a set piece um, out of the narrative, out of the stage. And what you get is this tight domestic focus as if that domestic space isn't a space of politics, as if that domestic space isn't a space of, of, of change. Um, or thinking about Rosa Parks' history as part of a movement, the Montgomery bus boycott wouldn't have worked if it hadn't been for the hundreds and thousands of domestic workers who oh. participated and upheld that boycott, who refused to ride the buses, and who walked the streets to show that they were refusing to write those and, and didn't, in fact, need the mis... I mean, there, and, there were, and, 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 there exactly. were, and there were white women who were part of that, right, who were part of that movement who helped to drive and all... But the point is that the white women were the help, right? right. They, right. they were the ones who were contributing, you know, small, helpful aspects. Right. They weren't the, the main story. Elon, I felt you itching a little bit. Uh, yes, because there was a scene in the movie. Like, when the movie decided to, uh, to walk out of the, uh, the white woman wonderland, uh, it went to uh, this... Uh, one of the maids was accused of stealing, and then she was bashed by a 
cop. Yes. Within a half hour to 45 minutes of that, she was in prison with Happy. other women, smiling and laughing like, this book is so funny, as opposed to her face still being bashed from being attacked over some nonsense. And this was like, oh, because you know what? Snark conquers all. We're just going to we're gonna have a poop pie and just fix it all out here. And I was terribly offended by that. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah, because it did. It, it felt like that was the one moment when we were starting to get to the level of violence that right. was possible in the Jim Crow South. Right. But then it was all made made better by right. this little story. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about the state of the help in American homes today. Don't go away. We're here talking about both fictional and historical representations of the help. But every day we entrust 2.5 million real life domestic workers with the care of our most precious possessions, our homes, our children, our parents, our loved ones. And every day we fall short of giving back the same care to them. Back with me, Elon James White, Mickey McKellia, and Miss Barbara Young. Barbara, I want to start with you here because um, I am fascinated that um, the historian and the political scientist and the, and the cultural comedian at the table are all enraged by this film, or at least critical of it. Um, and you're saying, no, there's ways in which this gave a voice, this, this had an opportunity. And I keep wanting to say, no, no, it was terrible. But the thing that I find terrible is the idea that it speaks for people who are domestic workers. You have been kind enough as not only a domestic worker, but also an organizer to join us. So I want to be sure that you can get a full opportunity to express the things that you found valuable about the film. Uh, you, you mentioned um, the civil rights movement. And um, one, one thing that I find that, that was very valuable in this film is that people millions of people get to see and view the film who were, um, I would say, are not interested in the civil rights movement, mm. not interested in domestic workers, but they get to see domestic workers and, and, and it, it tells the story of domestic workers. Whether wrong or right, the real life domestic workers today can, um, can join in the, with the film in spreading the word of what's, what goes on in the industry and the, 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 the sufferings that they face mm -hmm. and the, what I would say is the, what they gain from being um, domestic workers and in the household of the people that they work for. Yeah, Elon. See, uh, even as you're saying that, like, I, I, I find it problematic because, yes, that's the case. This is the, uh, the opening the, of the door for these problems. But th should this have been the case? Do we need a starter <laughs> story? It's like, you can't deal with real problems and real oppression and, re and how the, uh, uh, domestic workers have been uh, treated. So let's come up with this cute little thing that you can kind of, like, have a bite size of. And so now you kind of know that there was a little bit of a problem, not the real problem yet, just enough so that you can kind of go, oh, so apparently. Apparently, it wasn't all good for the domestic yeah. workers. Yeah, and I, I wanted to point out, you know, I, what, one of the things I, I learned from Clinging to Mammy is about this 1923 Senate-approved land space for a Mammy monument. Right. You know, so we just we just had the, the groundbreaking of the African American yes. History Museum, and I keep thinking that was probably the same ground on which they were going to put the Mammy monument in 1923. Yes. So this idea of kind of building monuments to domestic workers is not actually new, but it it's still sort of this covering, this imaginary, right? Right. right. Well, in the way of using this story, so in 1923, the United Dollars of the Confederacy are almost successful in erecting a national memorial to Mammies in D.C., um, coming right off the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial. And in conjunction with the Senate, passes, passes um, agrees to this land grant, the same Senate that defeats the dire anti-lynching bill, that refuses right. to protect black people from violence, celebrates this version of interracial relationships, celebrates this version of black and white um, interconnection that's not about violence, which I argue is fundamentally violent and is right. about doing violence to those women's lives. Um, this is a piece of that ongoing political narrative. And I think one of the, the, one of the histories, one of the figures that we have to include um, in thinking about this film and the book, the book The Help was published in February 2009. Within weeks of Barack Obama, I was like, "What else was happening in February of exactly. 2009?" Exactly. Right. So, so as candidate Obama and then President Obama is asking us to choose our better history, the better history that a number of people are choosing, the better history about the civil rights movement, about race relations, about progress, is the help. 
Yeah. And I find that terrifying yeah. and problematic. But it's exactly a part of this political framework. I think the thing that made me most nuts was that the Home Shopping Network developed a line of products inspired by the help. Mm -hmm. So that when the, when the film launched, you could go on the Home Shopping Network right. and buy, you know, Donna Reed dresses and right. waffle makers and, you know, all of these sorts of things. And I keep thinking, what... This commodification of black women's suffering again, right? So now home shopping can make money from the, the suffering of black women in the context of domestic work. Aunt Jemima Pancake Mix. Uh, Aunt Jemima That's, Pancake is the great, she's the great huckster of the 20th century, right? And this is, and this is also, again, indicative of like a bigger problem that we have with history in general. America is, uh, is a big fan of photoshopping history. So like, <laughs> the things that we don't like, it's like, oh, there's a dimple in the thigh of America, so we're going to take that out. Um, <laughs> and they kind of like, oh, Give see, look. the dimple in the thigh <laughs> of America. <laughs> Probably, yes, I said it. Um, and that's become a problem. And, I, and, and, we, and we're watching this happen all over the place when they wanted to take the N-word out of Huckleberry Finn. Uh, when how now in, uh, in, uh, they want to uh, change how the founding fathers are referred to and that, uh, about slavery and stuff like that. All of these different things are just all a part of a bigger change of history. And like we, we're upset about right now about the education of our children. Imagine once everyone gets finished with uh, just totally just wiping out everything they don't like. Then people are just going to be like, what? Negroes had a problem. That's crazy. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Young, I'm, I'm just, if, if there was, what you, I mean, your work is as an organizer, and, yeah. and, and I actually think the 2010 New York Bill of Rights around domestic workers mm -hmm. is probably the biggest 21st century civil rights win that none of us know very much about. What is the work now? So we've got it in one state. What, what are the next steps so that the work of domestic workers now is not what it was in 1965? The next step, what's going on now is we have a Domestic Workers Bill of Rights in the state of California. And that has already passed the one um, part of the legislature in California, and it's in the Senate. Um, for a vote. It's up for a vote in the Senate. We don't want it to be just like one state passed a domestic workers bill right. and um, this is something that New York did. We want California to pass the domestic workers bill of rights so that we can go on to other states and pass um, rights for workers. And we are just asking for the basic rights um, for workers. And um, when this movie The Help came out, we said, wow, the many millions of people that view this, we're asking them mm -hmm. to be the help for the, for the yeah. domestic workers uh, that are fighting for rights for the 2.5 million people who are doing this work throughout the country. Ms. Young, thank you so much. We are going to take a quick break and have more of this conversation as soon as we come back with Mayor Elon James White, Mickey McKellia, and Barbara Young. And we only have a few minutes left on this segment, but I didn't, I didn't want to move on yet because I felt like it, there's still something sort of missing. It's not just about sort of saying mean things about the movie. I mean, if we wanted to just sort of have a panel about everything that's wrong with Hollywood, that would be a different kind of panel. It could probably go on for three or four days. I just want to give each of you sort of one quick opportunity here to weigh in on what you either see as the contribution, the problem, or, or next steps. Right. Well, and it's also not about saying that movies shouldn't have characters who are domestic workers in them and that we shouldn't right. be foregrounding this history, which is a huge part of our history, but that the domestic worker characters should not be in the service, and I use that phrase literally, of the white narrative and white progress, white overcoming, that they need to be stories about domestic workers themselves. They need to be true to this history, and this film is not true to the history and mystifies the history in a way that that um, I'm afraid people will take away as being the story. Right, because the whole point of the story is really that Skeeter, Mosquito gets right. a job, Mosquito gets right. a boyfriend, Mosquito moves on. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, I mean... As, as much, uh, please know, as an artist, I am clear to disconnect uh, my critique of the movie to the uh, the, uh, the actors in the movie. I believe that uh, what they've done was a great job, but and people keep confusing that when they say when yeah. you critique the movie, they all of a sudden start defending the actresses. Right. And I need them to understand again, nuance. Something that is lost here is that I can find this terribly problematic and still be able to go. You guys did a great job. Right. Right, absolutely, that kind of... And then we have just about 10 seconds, Ms. And, uh, Ms. And, Young. And I think that um, 
people need to support the real life actors that are, is doing domestic work in this country because for too long domestic workers has been one of the best kept secret in this country um, as long as people want to have a career and a family they need to have a domestic worker in their house taking care of their children and their homes yep. and um, so we need the support of the millions of people who watch the movie and um, help us help the people in their communities to pass legislation, legislation. to help the workers. Ms. Young, I love that task. If you love the movie to help do something to actually pass workers' rights for domestic workers in your community. Thank you to Ms. Barbara Young, to Mickey McKellia, and to Elon James White, who's going to hang around a little bit longer. Up next, affirmative action. Is it going to be a thing of the past? We're going to dig into that after the break.